All right, welcome back. Uh, let's roll out to uh, Los Angeles and bring in Jason Brown, uh, the perfect person uh, for this conversation <laughs> we're about to have. Uh, news this afternoon that the Indianapolis Colts are hiring Jeff Saturday, Saturday on an interim basis uh, to be their head coach after firing Frank Reich. Uh, Saturday is in the Colts Ring of Honor. He was their center on their Super Bowl teams. He's worked at ESPN. Uh, I believe he's been a consultant for the Colts. And I believe at some point he was a head coach at the high school level uh, for three or four years. Uh, but this is an unusual hire. Uh, Twitter, social media, of course, is turning it racial uh, right off the bat that, you know, this is proof that. You know, everything Brian Flores said is true. How could the Colts make Jeff Saturday their interim head coach? Uh, so, JB, uh, former coach, and what, what do you think of the Colts giving Jeff Saturday a shot here as their interim head coach? Can I, can I coach? Can I go beat OC? <laughs> like, what are we doing here? Are we just hiring anyone? So I don't know. I just heard Lewis Riddick on ESPN talking about it. Uh, obviously, their colleagues at ESPN or whatever. Um, I don't know, man. I, it's hard for me to fathom that somebody's going to come out of a media booth and uh, an analyst role on a platform on a network and go right into coaching into a locker room of a bunch of men making a lot of money that have yet to see you coach, being around you at all. And you're going to go in there and demand respect because you're in their Hall of Fame. It doesn't really mean nothing anymore to these guys, man. These guys, you, as you know, we talked about last week, these guys are playing video games and worried about other things. I don't think they care who Jeff – some of them probably don't even know who Jeff Saturday is. Um, so I think it's kind of a joke. Uh, I think Ursay's kind of uh, – he's made some decisions that are very, very interesting to say the least. Um I mean, he fired the OC a week and a half ago. You just fired Reich. I get that. I figured that was happening. I, I think I said it on my show. It would happen before the season. Um, but Jeff Saturday, I mean, are you hiring Pat McAfee, too, to come in and be the special teams coordinator? I mean, what are we doing? We're making it kind of a mockery at this point. Let's hire somebody that's on the staff right now to at least weather the storm. In my estimation, if this gets out of hand, Jason – uh, this is even more of a slap in the face um, than it would be just hiring a guy that's on the staff just to weather the storm. Because if you're hiring Jeff Saturday to weather the storm, what if this thing gets out of, out of hand? Now you're just a mockery hiring a media member. Uh, I know you played and everything, but that's it's kind of slippery slope to me. I don't like it. I think there's a better hire on staff, but it is what it is. So the defense for the Colts has been playing relatively well. Their coordinator is Gus Bradley, former, I believe, Jacksonville Jaguars head coach. Uh, he would have been a candidate. He would have been a candidate. Uh, their special teams coordinator is a guy named Bubba Ventrone. He's eight years of experience. Their tight ends coach is Clayton Adams. Let's see. Where else? We get strength coach, passing game special. Parks for John Fox, senior defensive assistant, is on the staff. John Fox took a team to a Super Bowl. Uh, I think he's coached two different teams in the NFL. Old guy. He could have done. He could have done that. Uh, someone is say, Scotty Montgomery's on the staff. He's their running backs coach. Black dude. Oh my God. Uh, Nathan Ollie, former Ball State defensive lineman, is their defensive line coach. Nathan Ollie was a great uh, player at Ball State and a great young man. Uh, so there's a lot of – I'm going to tell you why I don't have a problem with this decision. Oh, Reggie Wayne is on their coaching staff. He's only got one year of experience former wide receiver and great player for the for the Colts. He's on their staff. I, it, to me, it's clear as day that Jim Mercer is buddies with Jeff Saturday. 
and they clearly talk all the time. And that's who's helping Jim Irsay evaluate what's going on with his football team. And so he turned to that person. These interim coaches never end up getting the head coaching job that I can remember. Most of them, and this far into the season, eight games into the season, they get the job, they finish out the year, and then they go hire uh, who they really want as coach. And what a lot of NFL owners have done to satisfy uh, the media crowd is they love to put, oh, Steve Wilkes, you come be the interim coach for the Carolina Panthers. You come oversee the fall of the Titanic. And now, oh, my God, we had a black coach and no one can question, did we consider a black coach? We put you in a losing position, you lost, and now we get to go hire who we really want. They're giving that job to Jeff Saturday. He's going to oversee the Titanic. And he's, I don't believe he'll end up being the head coach. They could, now again, there could be guys like Reggie Wayne saying, nah, I don't want this. Or Scotty Mitt, nah, I don't want this. Because I know how this plays out. I'm going to take these L's. We, we, we shouldn't have signed Matt Ryan as quarterback. Now we're out here starting Sam Ellinger. And so, you know what, I got a chance to put... 0 and 8 on my resume and never recover and never get the job. Jeff Saturday puts 0 and 8, goes right back to ESPN, no one cares. It, 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 it could be more well intentioned than some people may want to give credit for. Yeah, you know, Reggie Wayne, he shouldn't even be a thought. He just got the job this year. He just came in there. That's a Peyton Manning requested hire. Uh, so that's that's a that's we know that's not the guy. The two guys that have the experience and had a shot, who I thought they would have named the interim. Number one coming to mind, John Fox. He's an analyst helping out. I would think he could write the ship, just like they do with Barry Alvarez every year. They fire a guy at Wisconsin every year. Tennessee goes through it. They 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 bring in the old head coach, Coach Fulmer, and he's the interim. I could see John Fox being that guy, right? I'm, I'm the OG in the building. I can just write the ship. And then you got Gus Bradley. Uh, he's, he's had experience under Pete Carroll, who's probably coach of the year right now. You got, you got him that was under Carroll, was the D coordinator there, uh, was at two Super Bowls with Pete, won one, should have won another. He's got experience to write the ship as well. So you got those two that came to mind. I thought they were going to name him as soon as I heard Reich. I said, okay, Bradley or Fox will be the head coach. But this one is kind of out of left field. I, I get what you're saying. Um, no one's going to write this ship. They got a college quarterback. This, this quarterback they're playing is not an NFL starter, period, end of story. They're all, the problems on their offensive line, not fixable. Somebody is about to put a bunch of L's on their resume and there may have been some guys that didn't want to do it. If you go with Gus Bradley or John Fox, you're going to get, oh, old white guy, blah, blah, blah. Why don't you give it to so-and-so and so-and-so? And so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so may be smart enough to say, I don't want them L's. Maybe. That could happen. It has happened. I know, I know in situations that does happen. Um, and only a guy like Fox who can probably say, all right, no, I'll turn it down. Bradley? Can't afford to say no, turn it down. Sorry. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about Bradley or Fox. They would have taken the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ursay would then get criticized for hiring old white guys retreads. Why yeah. couldn't a black guy got the shot? And what I'm saying is the black guys on this staff, and by the way, Zane Fakes, a former Ball State tight end, is an assistant strength coach at uh, Indianapolis. I didn't realize that. But I'm <laughs> let, let, Scotty Montgomery, black dude, uh, with some experience. Ron Miles, defensive backs coach, black dude with some experience. Reggie Wayne just got to the staff. Uh, Richard Howe, oh, he's a strength and conditioning guy. Uh, but they may have been, anybody with a brain, Cato June, he's assistant linebackers coach, former coach player. Yep. Let, let's say even Kevin Mawai, great NFL center. I think he may be Samoan or something like that. Oh, these yeah. guys are smart enough to say, I'm not taking these L's and putting them on my resume. I'm not doing it because I'll never get a head coaching job. And so 
Ursay made an outside the box choice here that may be justifiable. Jeff Saturday can take these L's and go right back to being on TV. Yeah, I mean, I see it that way, but I just see it they could flip and, and, and make you, as Ursay, being a very, very unattractable um, employer. Let me say it that way. It's only 32 well, of these jobs, man. There's only 32 I, I, of these no, jobs. But, uh, it's what, like being what, a supermodel. What viable, replicable coach are you going to get in there, though, if you just continue to deal with coaches in the manner that he's continually dealing with them in? Like, what big-time coach is one going to go, I got to go work for Ursay? No, you don't. They're like, man, go ahead with that, with that BS. Hire an ESPN guy. Tony Dungy did it. Tony Dungy did it. Yeah, Tony Dungy did it. Then, when he had Peyton Manning. You ain't coming into Peyton Manning no more, brother. You're not even coming into Andrew Luck. You're walking into Ellinger, a guy that's never even played, and Matt Ryan, who's walking away with crutches, who's got nine kids at home waiting on him. Like, I don't know, man. It's a bad situation. And you know, as I know, the operating, the CEOs of these organizations, Jason, um, they either are, they bury your organization as the owner. Or they, they're the guys that go to the hero. They, they win them, and everyone praises Jerry Jones when he won three in a row. Nobody really talked about Jimmy Johnson until Jimmy Johnson left, and now Jerry Jones is horrible. And it goes that way. Belichick, if he don't start winning again, they're going to say Kraft was the guy, and now guess what? Kraft's horrible because you lost Brady and you haven't replaced him. I mean, it's just that's what it is. It's a results-oriented business, and it's what have you done for me lately, and the Colts haven't done anything lately and people forget really, really quick when you're bad. And you know, as I know, that goes for any profession in this world. All right, let me move on and address a couple of these Sunday issues with you before I, I let you go. And I appreciate you making the time today. Uh, I was just talking with uh, Steve Kim earlier about the way teams are defending Patrick Mahomes. They're not blitzing Patrick Mahomes. They're dropping into coverage and they're having success I think Indy, Buffalo, and now the Tennessee Titans been very reluctant to blitz Patrick Mahomes. It slowed down Kansas City's offense, nearly cost him a game last night. Why are teams dropping into coverage on Mahomes? Why is that working? Because he's just like, so that's what you, that, so the success to beat quarterbacks that are big arms, big talented guys with wideouts uh, is drop seven, just get four pass rushers on him. Try to beat the O-line with four, drop coverage, cloudy the coverage up for the QB. So you either have to tuck it and run like he did last night, which ultimately won him the game, or you've got to really dissect coverage and read it out. So the, the number one way to beat Tom Brady over the years has been what? Drop seven, bring four, play great coverage on the receivers, and get pressure with your front four, just like the Giants did in the Super Bowl, just like... Uh, the Rams did last year in the NFC title game. And just like New Orleans did three or four times during the regular season, which really gives him fits. Kansas City, same way. He has fits when you drop people into coverage because now an uh, offense predicated on dink and dunk, get it out fast, let's throw laterally, let's throw crossing routes, let's throw different plays that's quick, out-of-my-hand decision-making now it's not that. Now I got to sit there and throw the football 68 times last night, Jason. 68 times we threw the football in Kansas City, and you scored 20 points. So look at some stats and data and see the last time somebody threw it 68 times and only scored 20 points. Uh, I would find it really, really interesting to see what the points to versus throws would mean because that right there is not equating and that made him tuck and run, by the way. He ran for 65 yards. Crucial situations. Because they're in coverage, they drop seven, and now there's running lanes in there for a guy like Mahomes. So it's clouding him up. And I think great defensive coordinators know, as great as everyone wants to anoint Patrick Mahomes and how great of arm talent he is and, and all these things, they do know that he has some issues reading coverage and throwing it on time if it's not ad lib or... Um, his anticipatory window throws aren't great at all. I've just I've been breaking them down. He has to ad lib almost everything he does, and you saw why they struggled to score points last night. 
can't tell me you throw the football 68 times and score 20 points. It just doesn't even make sense. There's no way in the world. 68 throws out of 82 plays or whatever, it doesn't even make sense. 91. So, yes, 91. So it you drop coverage, you cloudy them up. All right, let me tuck and run it. And, and I don't see, I don't like what I see. And if you watch that game, Jason, I'm going to be the first one to say it on your show right here live. I see something wrong with Patrick Mahomes towards the end of the game. Either fatigue, A, from throwing it 68 times, which could be it, or somewhere he got dinged with a face mask and he had dead arm towards the end of that game because the last seven passes, the receiver caught the ball at his shoelaces and he had three balls hit the turf, hit the ground, skip to people. His arm was dead at the end of that game, and I don't know if it was fatigue Usually you don't see fatigue in that in that manner from throwing a football 68 times in one game. I think it was compiled with running the ball as much as he did, coming right back to a tempo offense, trying to throw it again. His arm was fatigued. His feet were out of place. He had some bad mechanics towards the end of the game, which is okay because you're tired as hell. I get it. So I'm not going to critique him and say he did bad things. He threw for 485 on, 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 on 68 passes. Um, so, like – the end of the day, he won the game with his feet because the defense did that, and I think you see that. You see it with Lamar tonight. You're going to see it with Lamar tonight. I think I think the Saints are going to keep him in the pocket as well and make him throw from the pocket without his best receiver. His tight end is out tonight. Very, It's going to be very intriguing to watch uh, my videos tonight on Twitter. Uh, but having said that, um, you know, that's the recipe. Buffalo did it last year. The Bengals did it. I mean, the Bengals did it last year. Buffalo did it earlier this year. Tampa did it in the Super Bowl. He struggles late to throw the football in anticipatory windows late in the game, and he struggles mildly, and that is what I – that's my only knock on him. Let me move it, you on, JB. Let, let me move you on to Tom Brady. Uh, I thought Tom Brady actually played at a high level yesterday and that his receivers let him down, including Scotty Miller on what should have been the game-winning touchdown pass a minute before he threw the game-winning touchdown pass. But I, I'm seeing all these drop passes, and I think they said there were six of them. And they, I mean, they were some easy catches, some easy balls. And again, I think Brady's still playing at a high level. His teammates aren't playing at a high level and they're not playing at a high level, I think, because Tom Brady's not all in with them. I, people make a big deal about the Brett Favre Monday Night Football game the day that his dad died. And I argued that day, I was like, hey, Brett Favre played okay. But what happened is the guys in that locker room that love Brett Favre elevated their play and made a bunch of circus catches for Brett Favre. And Brett Favre got all the credit, but it was actually guys stepping up on behalf of Brett Favre who were the stars of that Monday night football game. I argued it that Tuesday after that Monday night game. That, I don't see guys stepping up and playing with the kind of intensity and focus that they normally do for Tom Brady because Tom Brady's not all in with them. First of all, there's not a guy playing right now that would have even played in that game if their daddy died, number one. We're way too soft now. So, number one, nobody would even <laughs> showed up. Like, I give Favre the well. credit to show up. You know what I mean? He showed up to that game, which is already, to me, more than most. Because I was at practice the day my dad died. I was a coach. And I said, listen, I've signed up for this. I'll be at practice. My dad would have wanted it that way. I put him down. And I was at practice right after he passed the same day. Favre showing up to me was a big deal. And that is what made those guys make those plays. Because, like you said, they fought for him. Obviously, they liked him in the locker room. To, to your point, is Tom Brady someone that they're not really feeling? Are, are they, is he someone they're like, okay, this guy's half in, half out. We know Brett Favre was all in all the time with that team, just like some other guys are. But Tom Brady right now, is he a guy that's half in, half out, and I'm not here for you? Or, you know, you can see it the same way in, in, in Green Bay right now with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, very, very – both of these guys are very similar to me right now. They do not look like they're sold with two feet in. They both look like there's one foot in. 
Last night, I broke down Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers threw the football in the back corner and, like, walked up the field like, I'm done. Fourth down. Like, I ah, screw this. Bloop. He threw it out of bounds. Like, man, he's done in Green Bay. And and now last night, though, Jason, I'll, let me ask you this question. After watching Tom Brady, and even though those guys didn't perform, sometimes it takes one thing like that to bond a group of guys who, uh, who have about 60% of their roster who were on the Super Bowl winning team to say, all right, you back with us, dog? Let's go. And Tom Brady's going to be like, look, you guys are in. I'm in. I got divorced. I'm all in. Let's go. And do those guys buy in? Because Tampa still has a very, very strong skill set. They still have a bunch of great wideouts. Julio Jones can stay healthy, just another addition. And they do have defensive talent. They played as well as anyone in the first four or five weeks of the season on defense. That can be rectified. If they do get their center back, Jensen, I don't know if he's done for the year or not. Um, I saw reports both ways. If they can get a center back and, re- and, and classify that O-line as being, uh, you know, he's the guy that makes all those calls. If they get him back. Does Tom Brady make a phone call in three weeks to a man named Gronkowski and he comes back for the playoffs, which is something I'm hearing. And now you have a problem, Houston. You have a Tampa Bay team with a reassured Tom Brady uh, and Gronk shows up. And now the vibe in that locker room would be off the chain. Hard team I love beat. your point and I think you're right. And it crossed my mind yesterday watching the end of that game like oh I wonder if this comeback might be the spark that ignites this team and unifies them and I think you make an excellent point Brady can certainly say to these guys I have certainly sold out I'm I'm, you know I'm getting divorced I'm all in that that's something we'll have to keep our eye on that before you move on they played the early morning game who do they play they play this Sunday in the early morning game uh, it's a pretty good game, I thought. Uh, I'm not sure. And so, point, I, when you coach, when you're a coach and you have to discipline a cat, and let's say you discipline the starting quarterback and put him out for the week, which I've done, and I play the backup, and you win with the backup, you now just took back over your roster and your team. That is something I saw last night. You won with a half bought in wideout crew, and you still got the win against the defending Super Bowl champs, regardless of what we say about the Rams this year. They're the defending champs. And now your roster says, oh, shoot, we might be back in business. And now we're all in, Tom. If we know you're in, you took a couple chin shots for us. You got the ball delivered. Scotty, you failed me once. Uh, Mike Evans, you failed me. Godwin, you failed me. But are you in now or what? Let's go. I'll buy you guys a Rolex. I'll buy you dinner. Let's get it back going. And we'll see. And if we get and, and if if anyone can get Gronkowski back, it's Tom Brady. So it would be a very, very it would be a team that I would not want to play in the first round of the playoffs, I'll tell you that. Sunday morning, 9 30 a.m. Eastern, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Seattle Seahawks. That's gonna be a very interesting game. Based off this conversation you and I had. Excuse me? Overseas again? Yeah, it's it's 8.30 a.m. I'm not, um, let me figure out what country they're playing in, but Germany. Yeah, they're playing in Germany. Uh, This is going to be a very, very interesting football game. Uh, Let me ask you this. JB, I appreciate it. Let me ask you one more question before we get out of here. And And it's related to that game. It's related to that game. Uh, Russell Wilson, was he holding back the Seattle Seahawks? Nah, he went to two Super Bowls. I can't say that. He went to two, should have won two. That, that's, uh, that, 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 that was 10 years ago, JB. Yeah, six years ago. But at the same time, how could he be holding them back that long? They still had a pretty good roster. Um, they had a couple more playoff runs in there. I don't know if he was holding them back. I'm not going to say Geno Smith is a complete upgrade, okay? Again, we just broke down. Oh, you called him the MVP last week. Now he's not even an upgrade. Go ahead, JB. Of course I did because how he's playing right now. I would say that, continue to say that. What I'm saying is, though, if me and you were drafting in a room, are you taking Geno Smith over Russell Wilson? Hell no. 
So I'm just saying, right now, how he's playing, though, he's playing as good as anyone, and that's why I put him in this in the in MVP conversation. My point is, though, are we going to just say everything he did over there was a facade because now all of a sudden who, who couldn't have coached last year, according to the naysayers, Pete Carroll, is now coach of the year. So, like, wait, where are we at with this? Let's keep it real. So, like – that is where I'm at. I, I don't know. I, Russell's bad right now. We we know. We have a guy, Hackett, who can't seem to coach out of a paper bag either. And, you know, this is the thing I want to bring up about Seattle, though. Let me ask you this, and a lot of people haven't thought about it. Do you know they're traveling this season something like 27 or 47,000 miles compared to a Pittsburgh Steeler team who only traveled 7,000 miles during the whole season? Uh, uh, Seattle's traveled more than any other team in the history of professional football in one season, and he's winning. I have to look at that and say this is not only the coach of the year. He may be doing one of the best jobs with a makeshift team that I've seen in my entire life in the NFL. Pete Carroll's doing a hell of a job. I'd say makeshift quarterback, not a makeshift team. They got, you know, Lockett, Metcalf, Kenneth Walker. They got personnel. Walker, they got a, a Who's Kenneth Walker? A rookie. A rookie. rookie. That, that's, Who's the best player on defense? Rookie. A D2 corner. A Division II corner. That is draft, brother. That is personnel. Eye in the sky. He knows personnel better than anyone in America. That is why when he coached in college, you didn't even know who Nick Saban was. I dropped the mic on that. I can't even. I, I don't even have the strength to Jason. deal with your Nick Saban slander. I don't. I don't tolerate Nick Saban slander. That, that's a ridiculous. But I, I don't have. I don't have the time or the energy right Hold now. On. Let me give you food for thought. I have big time Division One buddies that coach under both coaches. Okay, I won't say the name. I'll tell you off air. He said, you know why Nick Saban's the best in football right now? I said, nah, I can have a couple guesses. He said, because Nick, because Pete Carroll's in the NFL. That's all I got to tell you. It's a good time to hang up on you, JB, and let you go. You're making ridiculous statements. Uh, we're going to let JB go, put him in the concussion protocol, the CTE protocol, and uh, we'll be back with him next week. <laughs> <laughs>